I am. Thank you really much. Thank you very much for having me. As you see, I'm, I'm not an archaeologist. I'm a nurse. Um, and really much more of a social scientist. So what I'm going to talk through is the health evaluation that we did alongside the programme. But to start with, I'll set the context by telling you a little bit about the programme uh, before I move on to that. I have to acknowledge that this is really a collaborative project um, of lots of different partners, and I think that's its beauty and its strength, and that we have uh, clinical, so we have a consultant psychiatrist that's part of the team, we've got the Restoration Trust, we've got the Richmond Fellowship, so you've got lots of different individuals coming with different perspectives, different points of view, coming together with a single goal, um, which is looking at the Human Homes Project. I'm not really going to go into this um, in too much detail because Tim touched upon this this morning. Apart from to acknowledge that there has been historically this link between mental health um, and heritage and landscapes. Um, so if you look at some of the, you know, for example, I live in, uh, in Dorset. With St Anne's is uh, one of the largest uh, mental health hospitals that we still have. And that's in the middle of Sandbanks, which is right on Catholic Cliff Beach. And they've actually still to this day have their own beach hut um, for the patients who are in this um, large uh, mental health hospital. So there's always been this tangible link. Although, as Tim alluded to this morning, we did move away from that and really moved much more into a scientific domain uh, and a focus on medication and really lost the links and the touch to landscape. But I think that is changing within the health service. It's recognising with the um, vast increasing numbers of people that are living with um, chronic mental illness that we actually need to look at doing things differently um, and maybe move away just from a, a a main reliance on um, medicine. So this is Human Henge, but I have to say as we've taken lots of photos of uh, volunteers and participants, um, we have all, all their consent to have the photos. Um, sometimes you'll see photos alongside um, excerpts that I've taken from the focus groups of the interviews. They're not necessarily the photographs representing the person that said that. Um, so I just have to make that um, really quite clear. And what we really wanted to do over the uh, 10 sessions, and the sessions are uh, down on the poster there, is to really develop opportunities to work with people with ongoing mental health issues, to walk the landscape, to come together in what we've termed as some sort of uh, creative cultural um, experience. And sadly, I didn't get to participate in any of this. <laughs> so I did none of the fun stuff um, because my role um, was to look at a formal evaluation from a health perspective. And that was quite keen, um, A, because it was part of the bid, but also if we're wanting to move in this direction um, and wanting to have an impact in the medical world, the world in which I sit, actually you do need numbers and you need empirical evidence to support that. Um, because we've got to demonstrate it's having an impact, or if it's having an impact, and if not, why not? And so the question we had was, does a creative exploration of historic landscape achieve sustained? For me, the key word was sustained. Measurable mental health and well-being outcomes for people with mental health conditions. Um, and I was part of shaping this. Because um, to start with, and I remember, I don't know if you remember Tim, um, having that discussion because some of the, um, the aims before that of the research, I'm saying, well, that's not feasible. That's just not feasible with the numbers. Um, and so I suppose that's where I've been my health aspect to say, actually, with the numbers that we've got, we've got to be realistic in what we're claiming to do and actually really measure what we're setting out to measure. And know with some faith that actually it's achievable. And so this is the process that we had. It is quite interesting because we had um, two groups of participants and we had the facilitators, which really came up earlier this morning about the responsibility to support people that are working on the programme that are perhaps dealing with issues that they've never come across before. So the facilitators didn't escape either. So they had a reflective session and we had a focus group. But I'm not going to focus on the facilitators for the purpose of this presentation. I'm going to focus on the participants. And so we had a mixed method approach. So we had a questionnaire that was pre-project, halfway through the project, at the end of the, pro uh, the project, and then one year post their human hinge experience. Because we wanted to know after the end, one year later, did it still have an impact on their mental health and well-being? And then we also had focus groups. So we had 24 people that participated in the group. There was 12 in group one and 12 in group two. It's quite important to note that um, participants could be part of Human Henge, but didn't have to be part of the research. And I was really quite keen um, that the research that we did was fair and ethical, so it wouldn't preclude you from doing Human Henge. That said, um, actually the majority of the participants um, did want to be part of the research. Because we had multiple sets of data collection, 
the very nature of working with people ongoing with mental health issues is at times um, they may have a mental health um, particular crisis. And so not everybody participated in each stage. Um, five participants didn't actually complete the programs. And it wasn't necessarily always due to ill health. Um, somebody got a job um, and, and therefore left the program. So the age range is quite interesting. So group one um, was slightly a bit older than group two and had more men than women. Um, and this is significant for me later on because it opens loads of questions when we look at what happened um, throughout the project uh, and the process. We use the short Warwick Edinburgh Mental Health Wellbeing Scale. It is a scale that's nationally validated uh, within uh, assessing mental health and well-being. So from a medical perspective, it, we're talking earlier about speaking to health uh, practitioners of their own language. This is the language they will understand. Um, and so this is the tool that we use. But actually, we were quite keen to also incorporate aspects around heritage um, and the cultural aspects. And so we added other questions around to what degree had they um, gone on walks? Um, to what degree have they visited museums? To what degree have they participated in a variety of other um, heritage type activities? We started off um, looking at their initial findings around what attracted them to come to Stonehenge. Uh, and for lots of people, Stonehenge itself was quite a big attraction. Um, for part of the participants, actually, it was personal development reasons. They wanted to do something different. They wanted to challenge themselves. They wanted to give themselves a new experience. And for five of the participants, it was an interest in history. But we have to recognize that being involved in Human Henge was a cost that the individuals had to also pay. So for many of them, they were very apprehensive about being involved in the project. And at the beginning, we didn't necessarily have a focus on what their particular diagnosis is from their mental illness. Um, they were all recruited through the Richmond Fellowship, um, which Danny's here. Um, and, and so they'd all had a shared background of a mental health issue. Some of them spoke about anxiety, and some of them were really quite worried about being in a group setting and meeting new people. So we have to acknowledge with any type of activity, there is a cost to the individual that's participating in that. And we need to acknowledge that and make sure that we build an infrastructure that supports those individuals um, whilst they're feeling anxious. At the end of the project, um, we asked them again, so what aspect of Human Henge project have they liked most? Stonehenge also came up um, quite um, at the top of the list. Um, and also the surrounding landscape. But for me, what I was interested in is they were also talking about this connectivity that we've spoken about various times this morning, about being with people and making friends. Um, and, and some of the things that they were saying to me was actually they felt safe because everybody else involved in the project had a mental illness. So they didn't feel they had to hide aspects of themselves because they could go there and they could be them. And they didn't have to filter. And it was okay if you felt sad, and it was okay if you didn't want to be involved because you could step out of the activity and then come back into the activity. So it was a very supportive um, environment throughout the whole of the thing. For many of them, actually, it taught them much more about their own particular mental health issues um, by sharing that <coughs> with other people and hearing their stories. When we look at the impact of their mental health and well-being, we ask them if they felt it had an impact, uh, and 56% identified they felt it had a positive impact on their mental health and well-being. 21% were unsure, and five didn't complete the question. But actually, some of the qualitative comments, because there were open boxes in the questionnaire where people could add aspects, is they would talk about a renewed interest. So they may have had an interest in, for example, in history, and it renewed an interest in history. Uh, for some of the participants, they had a previous history, um, a previous interest in photography. And actually, through being through part of the project, that had reignited a confidence to start taking photographs again. And for many of them, actually, they felt supported for the first time. We are talking about, for some individuals, quite significant uh, levels of anxiety where they had difficulty leaving the house. Um, and so actually stepping into a group of environment actually really taught them they had a lot more reserves than perhaps they realised that they'd had. It was quite interesting because I was a bit sceptical, I have to say, um, of doing the quant aspects at the beginning because I thought the participant size just isn't big enough um, to really uh, be able to look about whether there's any significant differences. How wrong was I? <laughs> so actually, um, for the participants that we had, 
Um, for three of the uh, five aspects in the Edinburgh uh, Warwick Scale, it was statistically significant. So it did have an impact on their health and well-being. And that was at the end of the project. I've just done the uh, focus groups and the questionnaires for the first group that are one year post. And I will do the second year one year post in March next year, and then I will know, actually, I'll be able to take the analysis further. But I was really surprised. For me, when I look at some of these issues, it's around the feeding close to people was particularly pertinent for me. So at the baseline, 30% of the participants said they rarely felt close to people. And at the end, it was 21.7. But in the middle, is 13. And part of me thinks part of that reflection of the end is that fear of the end and what's going to happen. So you have this dip in the middle when you're in the middle of the thing and you're feeling close, but as it comes to the end, you've got to look at what's happening there. And those were some of the discussions that we'd had earlier. We also did some uh, focus group activities. Um, so I used lots of different uh, mechanisms to elicit the qualitative uh, data. One of it's based on photo elicitation, which is using photos, because it taps into a very different part of your brain. Um, because if you use a photo and, and use your feelings of a photo uh, to develop words around a particular experience, you don't necessarily think cognitively, you think emotively and a part of being. Um, so actually it really, uh, and we led this creative activity, which I was a little bit anxious about because I thought, will people go with me on this? Um, but actually they did. So in the creative activity, they came up with lots of different words. Uh, and so the words were focused, yeah, part on the landscape, part on the environment, part on the history, but actually there was also lots around um, the group and being part of the group and feeling connected. Um, and these are individuals <coughs> who, for the majority of the time, feel very isolated because of the stigma that's associated with mental illness. These were some of the creative activities um, that they produced. So we have feeling freedom to relax in a group, allowing for the future to have a better outlook. It was just right being at one with the earth, seeing amazing things all about nature and enjoying learning about history from experts. But I have included this one, because this one shows uh, a face with lots of smiling faces and in the middle a sad face. So for some individuals it wasn't necessarily a positive experience, although for the majority it was. And for me this really elicits lots of questions. What is it in particular about this individual that wasn't positive? Is it linked to their gender? Is it linked to their age? Is it linked to their diagnosis? Is it linked to some other part of their uh, biographical details? And for each of those, um, we used, I used the date of birth of participants and their gender for each part of the data collection. So I can map every single thing back down to an individual. Uh, but only I can do that because of obviously um, confidentiality and my promise to the group um, that all the things will remain confidential to me. In the personal reflection activity, I wanted to give the participants an opportunity to be able to write things that maybe they don't want to say verbally in a group, um, but things that they felt were important for me to know. Uh, and 13 of the participants completed this, and there were themes around locating oneself. Um, locating myself within myself, but also myself within others. And it helped them to think about themselves and aspects of themselves <coughs> that they had lost. And many of them talked about how the mental illness had robbed them of certain things, of their hopes, their interests, um, their, their opportunities moving forward. It rekindled passions. Um, however, there was a big sense of sadness at the end. Uh, and what this is quite interesting for me is uh, group one uh, is the group that I said was slightly a bit older and predominantly more men. That group hasn't really continued post the project. Group two, which is slightly younger and predominantly more women, um, has a Facebook group. It's a, a vivid group that they still regularly meet. They go out together. They've spoken to some of the partners about free access to some of the resources. Uh, and so organically that has grown. And that's some of the reflections that we've taken as a group and I've fed back to the group around sowing the seeds in any future projects. Um, part of me thinks, should it be prescribed by us? And I'm uncomfortable with that because I think actually the organic things that develop naturally are likely to be the most sustainable. But can we sow the seeds for those opportunities around people to coming together um, post the end of the project? 
And then we had focus groups at the end. Um, and, and the focus groups um, really had different themes around... For me, one of the bigger things was being human. Uh, it probably re um, really spoke to me because of being a healthcare practitioner. Um, and the participants spoke about actually not being a mental health patient, but being a human being. Um, and so um, and reflections I've taken on this from a medical point of view is we do tend to medicalise um, all of our patients um, and clients and the system medicalises and the focus becomes their illness and not them as an individual. Whereas they felt in the project actually they were with like-minded individuals and it didn't really matter that they had a mental illness because that wasn't the focus. The focus was a group of people coming together doing a creative activity at Stonehenge. They also talked about um, challenging myself. Um, and so actually for one of the participants who really started to take a lot of her photography, um, she took some of the photographs into a shop and asked the shop if they wanted to buy some of her photographs. Something that she said she never would have done prior to the program. So for some individuals, it really did have an impact um, on their confidence and their ability to keep going. So where are we now? As I've said, I've just completed the um, one-year post uh, focus group um, with Group 1. Uh, and it was interesting some of the things that they were talking about, um, the things that they had done. And I haven't done any of their quantitative analysis yet. Uh, but some of the qualitative feedback that they had is for some of the individuals, um, one of them had now joined a support group for a particular mental illness that they'd said that they never would have done before. But actually meeting with other people um, in this activity made them realise that perhaps it's not as frightening as what he was thinking it was going to be. For another participant, he talked about uh, mending fractured relationships with his family. Because for him, his anxiety was so crippling that he found it very difficult to be in a social space. And that included a social space with his family. But throughout the project, he was able to develop strategies around managing his anxiety, although that wasn't the focus, that now he's able to and it sounds an awful word, but it's not meant to be, tolerate being with his family from an anxiety perspective. He loves them, but actually finds it very difficult um, socially interacting with them, and he's managed to do that. For another, it's reignited that passion for history, and he's continued looking, albeit in a very solitary way, but continued that passion with a focus on history. So for me, when I say, does it have an achieved, sustained, measurable mental health? I think it has a measurable impact. I think the qualitative data and the quantitative data tell me that. I don't know about the sustained. Uh, and the future is we've just been given funding to go to A3. Is that right? I always say that wrong because I'm not an archaeologist, and so these slides <laughs> don't really mean anything to me. Uh, because <laughs> what we want to know is, is there something significant about Stonehenge? Or will A3 um, elicit very similar results? And the other thing that I have done is I have asked the participants now who finished what their mental health diagnosis was. Because for me, that may give me some pictures is, does this type of activity suit some individuals more than others? Is it linked to gender? Is it linked to age? Is it linked to their mental health condition? Is it linked to other factors? And, and so for me, somebody said about opening Pandora's box. For me, it has opened a bit of a Pandora's box because my mind is now full of questions around areas that I think if we're pursuing this, we need to do it properly. And we need to make sure that we're doing it responsibly. And that means answering lots of questions. That's it. Thank you.